Hi everyone, Jun Rao from Come From Here, one of the original co-creators of Apache Kafka. Welcome to the Kafka Internals course. So here's what I'm going to cover in this course. First, we're going to look into what's inside the broker. We're going to talk about how the data plane works, the control plane works, and also how key-based topic retention is worked through contextual. We're also going to cover some of the guarantees, including durability guarantee, ordering guarantee, and then we're going to look into some of the more advanced capabilities, such as group cons uh, consumption, transactions, tier storage, elasticity, and the geo replication. But for this particular module, I'm just going to talk about fundamentals. If you are already familiar with Kafka, you may want to just skip this module and then continue with the next module. So this is a quick overview of the overall architecture of Kafka. As most people already know, Kafka is designed as event streaming system. So it's designed so that applications can act on those new events immediately as they occur. The core of that is the storage system. This is depicted at the bottom. This is designed for storing those data efficiently as events. And it's also designed as a distributed system, such that if your need grows over time, you can easily scale out the system to accommodate it for the growth. We have two primitive APIs for accessing the data stored in the storage layer. One is the produce API that allows people to publish the event into the storage layer. And the other is the consumer API that allows the application to read those events from the storage layer. On top of that, we build two higher level APIs. One is called the Connect API. This is actually designed for integrating Kafka with the rest of ecosystems. For example, if you have some external data sources, you want to get those data into Kafka, you can use those source connectors to get data into Kafka. If you have some data sinks, for example, like a search engine or maybe a graph engine, you want Kafka's data flow into the system, you can also use those sync connectors to flow Kafka's data into those data sinks. Another high-level API we have designed is for processing. One of the API we, uh, we have designed is for Java developers. It's called Kafka Stream. And another is more declarative. It's called KSQL. So it uses SQL-like syntax for allow the applications to build continuous processing of those events using SQL-like syntax. So the whole system is designed to have the processing layer separated from the storage layer. This way, the storage need and the processing need can be scaled out independently. The core concept in Kafka is called events. So what's an event? Well, event is just something that happens in the world. This can be a purchase order. This can be a payment. can be a click of a link. can be like an impression you showed for a web page. So each of those events is modeled in Kafka as a record. Each of the record has a timestamp, a key, a value, and optional headers. The payload is typically included in the, in the value. The key is used typically for three purposes. It's used for enforcing ordering. It's used for co-locating the data, uh, have the same key property. It can also be used for key retention, which we'll talk about later. Both on the key and the value are typically just byte arrays. This gives people the flexibility to encode the data in whatever way they want using their favorite serializer. For example, if you have integrated Kafka with Confluence schema registry using Avro serializer, then the value of the key and value may look something like this. For example, it will start with a magic byte, followed by the schema ID, which is four bytes, followed by the rest of the serialized data using the Avro encoding. Another key concept in Kafka is topic. So think of a topic as like a database table. It's a concept for organizing events of the same type together. So when you publish events into Kafka, you need to specify which topic you want to publish this into. And then similar, when you read the event, typically you want to specify the set of topics you want to subscribe or read from. So all the events published to a topic are, uh, are immutable, so they are append only. Since Kafka is designed as a distributed system, we need a way to distribute the data within the topic into the different computing nodes in the Kafka cluster. So this is achieved through this concept called partitions. When you create a topic, you can specify one or more of those partitions. And partition would be the unit of data distribution. And each, uh, for a given partition, its data typically is stored within a single broker in the Kafka cluster. Although with 
uh, the tier storage support from Confluent, we actually do allow the data for partition to go beyond the capacity of a single broker. Partition is also the unit for parallelism. Each partition can be accessed independently and they can be accessed in parallel by writing from the producer and reading from the consumers. Each of the event within the Kafka topic partition has a unique ID, which we call offset. This is a monotonically increasing number, and uh, once it's given out, it's never reused. So all the events are stored in the particular topic partition in that offset order, and it will be given and delivered to the consumer in that event order. As we'll see later, this will make it easier for the consumer to keep track where they are at. OK, that's pretty much the end of the first module. And if what we talk about so far is still new to you, you may want to review some of the basic concept by watching this Kafka 101 course from Confluent. Otherwise, see you in the next module. Hi, everyone. Danica Fine here. You'll see me in the following exercises as we walk through some pretty cool Kafka internals demos. In those, we'll be using Confluent Cloud, which is the easiest and fastest way to get started with Apache Kafka. If you don't already have an account, it's pretty important that you sign up. Just in case, and to get everyone on the same page, I'll walk you through the process. First off, you'll want to follow the URL on the screen. And keep note of that handy Internals 101 promo code. You'll need that later. On the sign-up page, enter your name, email, and password. Be sure to remember these sign-in details as you'll need them to access your account later. Click the Start Free button and wait to receive a confirmation email in your inbox. The link in the confirmation email will lead you to the next step, where you'll be prompted to set up your cluster. You can choose between a basic, standard, or dedicated cluster. Basic and standard clusters are serverless offerings where your free Confluent Cloud usage is only exhausted based on what you use, perfect for what we need today. For the exercises in this course, we'll choose the basic cluster. Usage costs will vary with any of these choices, but they are clearly shown at the bottom of the screen. That being said, once we wrap up these exercises, don't forget to stop and delete any resources that you created to avoid exhausting your free usage. Click Review to get one last look at the choices you've made and give your cluster a name, then Launch. It may take a few minutes for your cluster to be provisioned. And that's it. You'll receive an email once your cluster is fully provisioned. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and leverage that promo code that we saw earlier. From Settings, choose Billing and Payment. You'll see here that you have $400 of free Confluent Cloud usage, but if you select the Payment Details and Contacts tab, you can either add a credit card or choose to enter a promo code. We'll enter Internals 101 to get an additional $101 of free usage, which will be more than enough to get you through these course exercises. And with that done, you're ready to dive in. See you there.